Ephesians chapter 6. Uh, let me check on something real quick. Yeah, I did. I left that up there. That's good. That's good. Um, I got some examples for you this morning. I'll show you that. I'll show you what that means here in a minute. And uh, let me kick that back up there. There we go. Um, going from uh, where we started last week, understanding uh, what these Philistines represented. And what I did was, uh, I mentioned it last, uh, last Sunday morning, uh, why the number 40 was significant uh, in this story. And uh, what I did was uh, I've added a little bit to uh, what we're going to see this morning uh, to give you a biblical understanding of why I think this number 40 just sticks out, what it means in the Bible. And uh, by giving you biblical examples that I, I'm, I like to uh, I'd like to be able to just say, hey, it means this, it means, it means, it means this. But the idea is uh, if you get it from the scripture, uh, then you'll know what it means. And there'll be no, uh, no misunderstanding. Years ago when God decided to have me uh, study Bible prophecy, Bible numbers, and so on, um, I didn't want to study numbers in the Bible because I thought, well, that's, that's the devil, that's occult numerology. Uh, uh, that's, you know, that's the, the devil uses numerology and I'm, I'm just going to stay away from that. But, um, you know, I knew the number seven, I knew that was significant. So I thought, well, okay, Lord, I'll, I'll do it, but I'm going to be careful. And there was two books I had. One was from E.W. Bullinger, uh, called, uh, I think it was Bible Mathematics or something like that. It was written about a hundred some odd years ago. And um, I, I basically was just looking at the list of numbers to see what they meant. And I read, you know, most of his book and um, to, to get an understanding of why he said what he said. And then I had another book that was loaned to me that I never gave back to whoever loaned it to me. Don't ever loan me a book because you won't get it back. Just buy me one and I'll keep it. Uh, but anyway, I, it, was a, it was written more recently by an independent Baptist preacher, by the evangelist by the name of Ed Velo. And he didn't have a computer. He just used a Strong's Concordance and he, and he went with, uh, you know, he was studying numbers in the Bible uh, that way. From years of studying the Bible, he knew and probably had taken notes and knew that certain numbers were significant. So he also made a list of what he believed the numbers meant. And then for each chapter, he went into why he believed certain numbers meant certain things. Now, I, I, I like to say, I, you know, in what I've come up with, I'm standing on the shoulders of giants. These men, what they did was they did it the hard way. They read the scriptures, they counted it, they did it all by hand, and I had a computer. And so for me, it was a lot easier to do the study and to do the work. And um, so any place where, uh, if you've read uh, Bullinger's work or you read uh, Ed Velo's book and you see I might, I might say something different about a number, well, it's because I was able to actually study more quickly than what they did and I'm not trying to change what they said, I'm just sort of adding to it. I'm just standing on top of it, if that makes sense. Um, so anyway, the number four will represent two primary things. Number one, it will represent the gospel and, and that which saves man. And, and I'll give you an example. Uh, you remember the story where Jesus was in the house preaching and the house was full. And there was people standing outside in the doors listening to Jesus preach. Well, there was a man sick of the palsy. Remember that story? Jerry, how many, how many men took him to Jesus to get healed? Four men. They were bearing him on a sheet. They were carrying him on his bed. Four men, one at each corner. And they carried this man. Four men carried this sick man to Jesus. But the first thing Jesus did was not say, rise up and walk. 
the first thing Jesus did was, Thy sins be forgiven thee. And listen, four men, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, carried you to the cross, amen. Carried you to the cross, not for physical healing, but for spiritual healing. Thy sins be forgiven thee. Amen. How many days was Lazarus in the tomb? Four. Think about it. And Jesus waited deliberately. He was reported to him that Lazarus was sick. Jesus was within easy distance to walk to Lazarus. And just, or Jesus could have sat there and said, uh, God heal Lazarus. It would have been done. But he waited. And finally, Jesus knew it. He said, Lazarus is dead. And so they finally got up and traveled to him. And he had been in the tomb four days. And yet Jesus just said three words. Lazarus, come forth. And he that was dead came forth. You are dead in trespasses and sins, the Bible says. And God awakened you from death. He resurrected you. That's what baptism represents. You walk a new life. And now you are saved. So the four will represent the Gospels. It also will represent the false gospel. Another, in fact, four times, Paul said this. He said it in 2 Corinthians 11, someone will come preaching another gospel. So in the right next door to that, Galatians 1, Paul warned, and he said, I'm surprised you listened to someone preaching another gospel. He said it twice. And then he said, I'm here to tell you, if, though we or an angel from heaven preach you any other gospel, let him be accursed. As I've said before, so say I again. Though we or any man preach any other gospel, let him be accursed. Four times, that's in the Bible. Another gospel, another gospel, any other gospel, any other gospel, let him be accursed. So it represents the false gospel, and there is a, there's a bunch of false gospels, amen? Go to the Catholic Church, you'll see it right in front of you. That is a false gospel. That is a way that people are believing that will get them to heaven. It will never get them to heaven, amen? Never get them to heaven. So it represents that, but it also represents the spiritual realm. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try to get into that here in a little bit. Uh, so let me, uh, let's go to Ephesians 6, 12. Let me, uh, let me read this verse again here. The children of Israel did evil again in the sight of the Lord. So let's say that you, that you kind of backslid, or let's say you're not even saved. You are not born again. You are not saved. You are religious. You like religion. You like Christianity. You think it's the best. You might even be a church member, but you are not saved. Believe it or not. There are, people, there are people whose testimony was that they grew up in church, they lived in church, they served in church, they preached in churches, and they were lost. And they knew that they had to be saved. One of my favorite gospel singers, Mark Trammell. Mark Trammell started out with the Kingsmen back in the late 70s. Then he went to sing for the cathedrals, and he sang for them for probably 10 years or better. But while he was singing for the cathedral, and he grew up, his dad was pastor of a church down in Little Rock, Arkansas, Baptist church down in Little Rock, Arkansas. He grew up doing the music in that church, playing bass guitar, singing in that church, grew up uh, uh, in, in church all of his life. And they were out in Oklahoma City uh, with a pastor that I, I never met him, but I knew of him. It was, uh, I can't remember his name, but it was First Southern Baptist Church in Dell City, Oklahoma. And they were out playing golf with this man because they were singing at his church. And like on the third tee box, Mark Trammell broke down because God had been dealing with him about things in his life. And he broke down and started weeping. And that pastor said, Mark, what's going on? He said, I, I think I'm religious. I don't think I'm saved. I think I'm going to hell. And he got saved right there on the golf course. Bowed down at the third tee box, eyes just full of tears, weeping to God, saying, God, save me. God, don't let me go to hell. I'm telling you what, God will save you. Amen. But people can be in church and be lost. So anyway, uh, the, the children of Israel did evil again in the sight of the Lord, and the Lord delivered them into the hand of the Philistines 40 years. Now, Ephesians 6. And let's read a little bit of the background again so we get the gist of it. Uh, you know me, I don't like to leave scriptures hanging around. If they're there... Let's look at them. So he says in verse 10, Finally, brethren, 
Uh, finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. Uh, if, and if you've got part of the armor of God on, you ain't got the whole armor of God on. And you'll need all of it. Verse 12. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against. Number one. Principalities. And we covered that uh, last Sunday. Not going to cover it again. Uh, but you understand that there are devils that desire to sit on the throne of your life. Uh, Ephesians 2 2 tells us that if you are if you are not saved, he's already there. The prince of the power of the air. The spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience. That's Ephesians 2, 2. Underline that part in your Bible or make a note of it. If you are lost today, he's already there. And if you wonder why you're having issues in life with things that you cannot control, he's the reason. He has you in bondage. He sits on the throne of your heart. And he's the one telling you, don't listen to that preacher. He's stupid. He's crazy. He believes in monsters. He believes in dragons. He's nuts. Why, he's even got stuff on UFOs on the internet. My goodness, he must be crazy. I even heard him say something about Sasquatch one time. I think he's nuts. Don't listen to this guy. Or don't listen to that verse. That Bible was, that Bible was written by men. You know that. And so if there's a spirit in your heart telling you that this morning, you're lost. You are lost. The prince of the power of the air is sitting on the throne of your heart. That's what a principality is. They sit on the thrones over churches. They sit over thrones over whole families. They sit on thrones over a household. They sit on thrones in areas, cities, Festus, Crystal City, uh, St. Lu Louis. <laughs> Amen. East St. Louis, Brooklyn, Illinois, Chicago, Illinois, South Side, where Leroy Brown lives. Okay? There's a, listen, there's a principality over certain areas. You believe that. And listen, it ain't just on the south side of Chicago. It's on the north side, too. That's where all the rich people live. They got a different spirit, but it's, it's a spirit nonetheless. So principalities. And then we have powers. That's what we're going to look at today. May not get through all of it. Against the rulers of the darkness of this world. I want you to think about what that could mean. And against spiritual wickedness in high places. I learned something this week about the, that phrase, high places. And I'll share it with you when we get there. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, I ask your blessings now upon your word. And Lord, I, again, I have nothing. I've put what work I can into the message. But I have nothing, Lord, to say to these people that would even make sense if your Holy Spirit doesn't say it in their heart. And so I pray, dear God, that the Holy Ghost, that, uh, the Spirit of Christ, would preach on the inside what I preach on the outside. There would be two agreements there, two witnesses, bearing witness to each and every heart, Lord, of the truth of your word. And I pray, Lord, that it would make changes in someone's life, Lord, or they will learn, Father, the, the, maybe the issues that they have dealt with before in life. It will give them understanding of why maybe things turned out the way they did. But I pray, Lord, that you would just bless your word however you want to in each and every life. We pray this in Jesus' name and amen. Uh, let me very quickly, let me go. That's principalities. Already done that. So the number 4, 40, 400, 4,000. It will almost always deal with, as we said, it will deal with either the spiritual realm, uh, heaven, Heaven, Jerusalem, New Jerusalem, is a spiritual city. That, it's real. In fact, it's more real than Festus is. It's more real than that. It's more real than us living here now. Uh, it is a city built, how? Four square. Okay? Number one, it means it was built on the God. They, they, they intertwine with each other. They, intersect, they mean the same thing. It was built upon the gospel of Jesus Christ. The, the foundation of it are the 12 apostles 
the walls are the 12 tribes of Israel. And you cannot get in. The 12 tribes of Israel represent the Old Testament. The apostles represent the New Testament. You cannot get in New Jerusalem unless you believe the word of God. Somebody, Both Testaments, somebody say amen. Can't get in. You cannot get into heaven. You cannot call God's word a liar and say, well, I'm going to heaven anyway. I just, I mean, I believe John 3, 16. But the rest of that stuff about Noah and, and, and uh, Jonah being the whale's belly, we know that they know well like that. And that, and that uh, science has proved that wrong. And I don't believe that stuff. Listen, I'm telling you something. You can't just believe part of the Bible. It's all or nothing with God. Amen. All or nothing with God. So it either represents the spiritual realm. We're seeing four different types of spirits here in Ephesians 6. Uh, or it represents, like I said, the true gospel and the false gospel. Look at this, look at this verse, Acts chapter 4. And, and the, the, uh, Luke is the one who wrote the book of Acts. And he's actually quoting from Psalm chapter 2. And he's saying, the kings of the earth stood up and the rulers were gathered together against the Lord and against his Christ. So he, he's using this now. I think this is Peter preaching. And Peter is using Acts chapter, or excuse me, Psalm chapter 2 to illustrate what is happening right there with why people hate, hated Jesus Christ in the day that Peter was preaching. And he says, verse 27, for of a truth against the holy child Jesus, whom thou hast anointed both Herod, Pontius Pilate, with the Gentiles, and the people of Israel were gathered together. How many? Now think about that. We wrestle not against flesh and blood. The real enemy wasn't Herod. It wasn't Pontius Pilate. It was, it's not the Gentiles. It's not the Jews. The real enemy is principalities and powers and rulers of the darkness of this world and spiritual wickedness in high places. Herod and Pontius Pilate and the Gentiles who want to, want to worship idols and the Jews who want to keep, think they want to keep the law and they don't want anything to do with Jesus. They think uh, in various ways that they're acting independently, but the truth of it is there is a spirit that's guiding them to hate the gospel and they are gathered you have Herod, who was the king, who was over the Jews, and Pontius Pilate, who, was, who had been given authority by Caesar. Those two guys hated each other. You remember that in the Bible? Herod and Pontius Pilate hated each other until the crucifixion of Christ. And after that, they were buddies. How did that happen? Same spirit. Same spirit working against them working in them to be against the anointed one of God, who was Jesus Christ. And then Colossians, turn there. Colossians chapter 1. Look at these in your Bible. Underline these so you'll say, well, there's four things here. You'll remember it next time you study. God's given you a textbook, and they told you in school that you could not write in your textbook. I'm telling you to write in it. Amen. Make notes in it. Underline. Circle stuff. Wear it out. Amen. So you have to have tape holding your Bible together. What is it? They say a Bible falling apart belongs to a Christian who ain't. Colossians 1.16. For by him, meaning Christ, were all things created. Is there anything that exists that was not created by Jesus Christ? It's all created by him that are in number one that are in heaven. Number two that are in earth. Number three, whether they be visible and invisible four things. Whether they be thrones. Now we're getting into the spiritual part thrones or dominions or principalities. Or powers. That's the first two out of the list in Ephesians 6. So, whether it's in heaven or earth, visible or invisible, it was created by Christ, who is the one spoken of in the four Gospels. And it represents heaven, earth, visible, invisible. 
Whether they be thrones, dominions, principalities, or powers. These are all types of spirits. All things were created by him and for him. Here's another example. Turn to Daniel chapter 2. We're just, we're just calling this going to school. You're going to school. Daniel chapter 2. Shut up, Siri. She was mouthing something off to me. I don't know what it was. Daniel chapter 2. Boy, I could, I could use this number four and tell you something about artificial intelligence and quantum computing. Daniel chapter 2. This is the chapter where Nebuchadnezzar has a dream and he can't remember it. So in the second year, and I wanted you to turn here because we're going to see four things. But there's something else in here too. In the second year of the reign of Nebuchadnezzar, Nebuchadnezzar dreamed dreams. Wherewith his spirit was troubled and his sleep break from him. Then the king commanded to call, number one, the magicians. Now, here's where we're going to get into powers. Magicians. And I'm not talking about. Um, I'm not talking about uh, like street music magicians or stage magicians. Uh, people who make coins dis disappear or saw bodies in half. All that is done by illusion. Okay. And I love to watch magicians and I'll, I like to watch recordings of magicians so I can see how they did it. I watched David Copperfield walk through the Great Wall of China and I recorded it. I was in Bible college at the time and I, I had used the VCR in the library and I recorded it. And I watched that thing probably 30 times until I figured out how he did it. And I got him. I got him. But anyway, uh, magician. we're talking about people who use spiritual forces for pretended magic power. There is no such thing as someone having magic powers. There are devils who respond in an invisible fashion doing things that seemingly to us in the physical, visible world are impossible. Like people who say they have telekinesis, people who think, who believe that they can with their mind move objects or whatever. There is, your mind cannot move. Jesus said you cannot with your mind think that you are a cubit taller than you really are and then all of a sudden you grow a cubit overnight there it that doesn't exist there is a there is a devil a spirit of some kind working in an invisible fashion moving the object that you think that your mind is moving or people are led to believe that your mind that your mind is moving that but there is no real thing as magic there are devils who use their abilities to hide things from men to give men or women what they believe is magic or witchcraft. Number two, astrologers. There, the, the position of the planet Jupiter and the planet Venus do not determine how your day is going to go tomorrow. You cannot, you know what astrology is? Astrology, you know what the stars are in the Bible? Angels, either good angels or bad ones. And when you say you study astrology, you say you are saying that these spirits, these devils are determining the course of my life. They are predicting my life by their movements and positions in the sky. And by that, I know how my day is going to go tomorrow. That is a lot. You, basically, you are Ephesians 2, 2. There is a prince of the power of the air or there is a... Um, Principalities, power, rulers of the darkness of this world. When do stars come out? Night. So how can we know their position? We wait till night, look up at the telescope, look up in the sky. That's their position. So my astrologer said this is going to happen to me tomorrow. That is how that's done. Astrology. That's part of the thing God said don't do. Sorcerers. Sorcery is witchcraft. It is magic in the real sense. 
And it basically is powers given to someone by devil spirits. And I'm going to preach on powers this morning. The Chaldeans. Uh, it tells you later on in the book of Daniel what the Chaldeans represent. I think it is the deal with uh, Belshazzar. Uh, and I, I was late last night and I didn't get this note. Um, hang on a second. I'm looking here. Um, no, I can't find it uh, right offhand. Oh, yeah. Daniel chapter 5, verse 7. The king will cry out aloud and to bring the astrologers, the Chaldeans, soothsayers. Um, anyway, the Chaldeans had something to do with magic, astrology, soothsaying, divination of some kind. And, uh, and divination basically is receiving information that is not brought into you by the five senses, seeing, hearing, smelling, tasting, and touching. Information or knowledge that is given to you by what people would call a sixth sense. If you say you have a sixth sense, I'm sorry, but you're listening to a spirit. That's your sixth sense right there. You are receiving knowledge that did not come to you through your, you didn't read it in the paper, you didn't see it on the internet, you didn't hear it in, in somebody talking to you, you did not feel it with your hands, you did not smell it with your nose, you did not taste it with your mouth. That's what, that's what divination is. Now, so they brought four magicians, astrologers, sorcerers, Chaldeans for to show the king his dreams. And all of these are led by spirits. That's Daniel chapter 2. Now, guess who ends up giving the real answer? Four other guys. Look at verse... Uh, let's see here. Look at verse 17 of Daniel chapter 2. Then Daniel went to his house and made the thing known to Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, his companions. Who is Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah? Who is that? Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. That's their Babylonian names. So how many people now are in on Daniel's side? Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. There's four people on Daniel's side. And the Bible says, verse 18, that they went to prayer that they would desire mercies of the God of heaven concerning the secret and that Daniel and his fellows should not perish with the rest of the wise men of Babylon. Four, four on the devil's side can't figure out what the dream is. Four on God's side got it. Somebody say amen. We have more power than they have. Though we be smaller than they, we've got more power than they have. So you now you see the four against the four. It's like the gospel against the, the false gospel. It's like God's kingdom against the devil's kingdom. And that's what we're dealing with. Do I got another one? Yeah. How many cities were destroyed on the day that God destroyed Sodom? Four. Sodom, Gomorrah, Adma, Zeboam. And you know what they all represent? A city that is going to be destroyed in a similar fashion. What would be the name of that city? Mystery. Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots and abominations of the earth. That's who Sodom, Gomorrah, Adma, and Zeboam represent. Because God's going to destroy Babylon exactly the same way he did Sodom and Gomorrah and these other two, four cities. He destroyed them. And he's going to destroy Babylon the exact same way so that no, nobody lives in Sodom anymore, do they? Nobody lives in Gomorrah. Nobody lives in Adma. Nobody lives in Zebo. In fact, we don't know where they are. They're gone. And God is going to do the same thing to Babylon. Read Revelation 17 and 18. All right, now, powers. That took up most of my time. But y'all went to school today. Amen? What's the, uh, in fact, let me, let me kill a little bit more time here with you. What's the fourth book of the Bible? Numbers. 
Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers. There's a story in the book of Numbers where the children of Israel murmur and complain against Moses and against God for feeding them manna every day. And they're mad at God. And so they take it out on Moses and they're complaining. And so God sends fiery serpents and bit many of them and many of the thousands of them perished. They all died. So what did God they, they finally said, okay, okay, we're not going to complain no more. Moses, will you go and ask God to stop this? And these were not ordinary snakes either. These are fiery serpents. These are devils. Fiery flying serpents. Look that up in your Bible. Okay, these are devils. And they were being, when you're bit by a devil, you, uh, a snake bite kit won't work. Antivenom won't work. Something of a higher power can only save you. So they go to Moses, ask, ask God, what, what can we do? Moses, God says, Moses, make a fiery serpent, make a brass serpent, put it on a brazen pole and set it up so that everybody could see it. And whoever looks upon it shall live. You know what that is? That's the doctrine of salvation by grace through faith. If they believe what Noah said, all they have to do is look at the snake. And if they've been bit, they're healed instantly. Isn't that the doctrine of grace through faith? If you don't believe what God said or Moses said, you won't look. You'll say, that's stupid, and you'll die. If you believe what Moses said, you'll look and go, I'm cured. Now, why did I bring that up? Do you know what that's a picture of? Christ. And how do we know that? Because, let's see, it's in John chapter 3. What book of the New Testament is John? As Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even, Mo, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. How many of you see the gospel there? And it was there in the fourth book of the Bible, Numbers, and Jesus in the fourth book of the New Testament tied them together and said, this is how it is. When you see me lifted up, if Jesus said, if I be lifted up, I will draw all men unto me. Whew! So I'll, I'll just think of stories with four, 40, 400, 4,000. How many people did Jesus feed at one time? 4,000. Being fed is a type of God feeding us and giving us nourishment, giving us the word of God. All right, now let me move on to this. Let me just get started in this. Okay, and then... We'll, we'll, we'll tackle it next Sunday, okay? Uh, again, those of you who, have, who are not used to me, don't know me, I'm not interested in giving you three points of a sermon and a little cute saying at the end of it. What God has called me to do, the only thing I know how to do, is give you Scripture, 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 Scripture. It's all I know how to do. I used to really struggle at preaching. I would used it, I mean, I mean, it bothered me to preach. Because I kept thinking, how am I going to come up with enough words to say? And then when God started dealing with me about using Scripture to let God say it, it just became a lot easier. So now let's look into powers for a minute. First Chronicles chapter 29. <clears throat> We're going to get a sense of what he's referring to here. First Chronicles 29.10 Wherefore David blessed the Lord... Okay, and I have that underlined before all the congregation. And David said, blessed be thou, Lord God of Israel, our father, forever and ever. Thine, O Lord, is the greatness and the power and the glory and the victory and the majesty. For all that is in the heaven and in the earth is thine. So let me ask a, a simple question. Uh, Ron, they're going to clip on your nose tomorrow. Whose nose does that belong to? It's God's nose. You're not helping me out, Ron. It's your nose. Thank you very much, Sandy, for helping him out. It's your nose. Do I have a right to just go over 
and snip off a piece of your nose. No. I, that's called assault and battery. And I would go to jail for that. Okay, that's wrong. It's your nose. And so the doctor said, okay, we're going to just cut a little bit off here and do this. And I guarantee you, if you haven't already, tomorrow you're going to sign some papers that gives the doctor what? Permission or power. And he's going to define exactly what he's going to do. He's going to, and he's going to, he, you're going to give him the power over this much of your nose. Now, if you wake up and the whole nose is gone, there's going to be a fist fight first, then a lawsuit, right? Because he did not have power to take your whole face off. Just a little piece of your nose. Now, who made heaven? God. Who made the earth? Everybody say God. So if it belongs to God, does he not have the power to do what he wants to with it? Who made you? God. If God made you, God has the power to do with you what he wants. Nobody dies. Except God says so. Now, if you don't believe that, I'm sorry. But I'm, I just read to you, thy, verse 11, Thine, O Lord, is the greatness and the power. Why? Because for all that is in the heaven and the earth is thine. Thine is the kingdom, O Lord, and thou art exalted as head above all. Both